Hello and welcome back to the channel of nonsense. Now, if you want a beautiful 610 horsepower hybrid like this Polestar 1, then you need to hurry up and find £140,000 before the end of 2021 because it's going to go off sale. And I think that's a very sad thing for reasons I'm about to explain after the following slow-mo section of beauty shots. Now you might be forgiven for wondering what the hell this is and it's kind of hard to pin down really. It's sort of a plug-in hybrid GT car with a sporty side and despite being made in China it's got more Scandi cool than I don't know a noir TV series about ABBA eating meatballs on a flat pack bridge. I guess it is utterly stunning. I don't need to really talk about the looks other than say I think it's the most beautiful car on sale today or not for sale much longer. Let's have a poke around it, show you what it's like and what it's been like to live with. It's very interesting, it's a curious thing. Now pull up a comfy chair and make yourself a cup of tea because this might take a little while. You might expect there to be a big V8 under the hood of a 610 horsepower GT car, but no, two litre, four cylinder, turbocharged and supercharged petrol engine, putting 326 horsepower to the front wheels. And it's got two 85 kilowatt electric motors on the back axle and a 52 kilowatt integrated starter generator thing, which provides torque in between gear shifts in the eight speed automatic gearbox. Ah, there's a lot, but basically this has got quite a small 34 kilowatt hour battery, but, can do 77 miles on electric power alone, which is more than pretty much any other hybrid you can buy. So yeah, altogether, 610 horsepower, a thousand newton meters of torque. I'm trying to remember facts here for you. So yeah, we'll talk about performance when we come to driving it, but naught to 60 should be 4.2 seconds, which doesn't sound that much for the four wheel drive, 610 horsepower, does it? Anyway, you'll also see under here, you've got these manually adjustable Erlins dampers, that's kind of a track car thing. I don't know why they put them on a GT car. I think this should just have nice automatic adaptive dampers, but hey, I guess they're trying to be as bloody Swedish as they bloody possibly can be. Meatballs. You might be thinking that all that electric gubbins will make this quite a heavy car. And you're right, it's 2.35 tonnes this, despite mostly being made of a carbon fibre reinforced polymer with a steel floor to the body. So yeah, it is quite heavy. That's why you get these whopping great aluminium monoblock Akebono calipers. You've got these super cool frameless door mirrors, which are said to reduce drag by 30% over your regular framed ones. And uh, yeah, glass roof, lots of carbon fibre in here. You can't see it, obviously. But yeah, there's a lot of hidden technology under the body of this car to try and keep the weight low, if not actually low, as in a small number. Does that make sense? Believe it or not, things get even prettier around the back. You get a rear wing that lifts up at 62 miles an hour. You get the Polestar badge, which no one really recognizes, which I think is why there's a little sticker on the front wing you might have noticed that says Polestar 1, because when you drive this and park up to charge it, feels like the entire world descends on you. So, oh my God, what's that? I've never seen one of those. Please tell me in great detail about the details of its hybrids. It would be completely remiss of me not to show you the Polestar 1's boot because it's teeny tiny. It's 126 litres. That's less than half a Volkswagen Up's boot space. Kind of undoes the GT car thing a bit, doesn't it? But I think some soft bags, you would be all right. What I like though is the window of electricity. You've got these orange cables showing you uh, what the wires do, DC charge, AC charge, MSD, CIDD, MDMA, all that kind of stuff in here. I guess they had to put this in really to show why the boot is so small, I guess. It's quite concept car-y, but yeah, whatever. It's just not that big. Let's talk about the interior of the Polestar 1. It does have back seats, but they're fairly small. They've got isofix on each side, but I think if your child seat has a base, you're really going to struggle because there's barely any leg room and headroom's a bit cramped as well. But up front, it is beautiful. It's like a Volvo that's been made even more special. And lots of bits are Volvo, you like the infotainment, which is fine, but it doesn't have wireless CarPlay. And I can't find any wireless charging in here either. 
I just think is a little bit too old for that, but that is fine. And the sound system, the Bowers and Wilkins is insane. You can actually choose different sound stages like a studio or even the Gothenburg concert hall, which to be honest, just makes it sound a bit like you're singing in the bath, but whatever. Uh, crystal gear knob with a little Polestar logo etched into the middle of it. Beautiful, really nice and cold. Cubby holes there, cup holders rather. Um, you've got a 12 volt a USB or two USBs under there. Not actually a huge amount of room because this centre tunnel is full of batteries. I said all of those words slightly weird. Let's just keep going. Digital driver's display, steering wheel's really nice, bound in leather carbon fiber metal lots of shiny bits it's really nice and airy because this is all glass it looks like a solid black roof from the outside but it's actually just a huge tinted bit of glass and this kind of floats up here you can get your hand in there and it feels like it might have a light in there i've not actually used this at night but i know the polestar 2 projects the polestar logo up onto the glass roof at night so this maybe does the same and you've got a glove box but actually other than the fact they're all left-hand drive, there's very little to fault with the interior, apart from it does creak and rattle a fair bit on the motorway. Just around the C pillars at the back, there's something of the leather there, it just creaks and rattles. So anyway, drown it out with your Gothenburg toilet music. Let's go and drive this thing, because I've sat around talking about it too much, and I've not even mentioned the yellow seat belts or the nicely punched leather. It's all beautiful in here. Another day, another National Trust car park, but let's find out what the Polestar 1 is like to drive if you turn it on rather than off. The crystal gear knob feels lovely. Pull it back into drive. Defaults to hybrid mode, which tries to use the electric motor as much as possible. So it's very quiet and hushed, but you can already tell <laughs> on this slightly bumpy car park that it's got a reasonably firm ride. It's kind of it's not quite sporty, it's just you can feel bumps and lumps in the road. So I'm going to take you for a bit of a pootle now. The stats on this car, as I've said before, 0-60 in 4.2 seconds. And it'll do 155 mile an hour limited, I presume, flat out. And it'll do 100 mile an hour on electric power alone. So it's, oh, it's no shrinking violet. But yeah, put your foot down. And it is quick, it is definitely quick. But I've driven 600 horsepower cars which don't have the weight of electric motors and they obviously feel a lot faster and a lot more, I don't know, just a lot more alive than this does. But I've done a big journey. I went up to Silverstone in this the other day and that was about 80 miles and it did most of it on electric power alone. I got like 52 MPG or something on average, which is astonishing really for a 2.3 ton car, sorry, car with 610 horsepower and a thousand newton meters of torque it's it's pretty good it charges at 50 kilowatts so you can charge the battery from flat in well, under an hour um it'd be nicer if they could get it up to 150 kilowatts because that'd be like that but there we go performance from a standstill isn't hugely fast it's really the roll-on performance so say from 50 to 70 that is the bit that makes you think hmm really quick this and driving it around uh, roundabouts near Silverstone, my God, you can fly off those. However, it does understeer reasonably early on. You sense the mass of the car, and although it has got torque vectoring on the rear axle, I never really feel it. I would like to have felt it more like in a Porsche Taycan helping me around the corners. But I guess, again, it's not an out and out sports car really, is it? And that's why I find it quite weird that they put those Erlins adjustable dampers on because I'd rather just be able to say soft, hard on the screen rather than having to twiddle things under the bonnet. And I just don't think any owners are actually going to do that. Okay, skip lorry, you're actually going down there. Look, like right, 0, 0, 0 to 50. There we go. So it is quick, it is quick, but it's kind of almost hyper hatch quick rather than supercar quick, if that makes sense. But yeah, what else should I talk about? The visibility is incredible out of this because there's so much glass, pretty much the full length of the roof. You can see over your shoulder, you can see out, not a problem really. It's very easy to drive, the mirrors are very clear and they're super cool because they've not got frames around them on the door mirror and the centre mirror doesn't have a frame around it either. And yeah, it's quiet and relaxed and it's not part of the driving experience but that sound system is flipping epic. Anyway, I'm going to stop yapping. I'll get to my twisty road, do the 30 to 60 test, and then hand back to me. So anyway, I'll see you in a minute. 
Just before we get to my twisty country road, let's talk about driving modes quickly. You select them using a little pushy rollery thing down here. You've got all-wheel drive, which is all-wheel drive, petrol and electric. Pure, which only uses the electric motor, so it's rear-wheel drive. Hybrid, which obviously mixes both of them together in an efficient way, which means you get quiet driving experience most of the time. Individual and power. So I'm gonna use power because it says sporty driving. And I'm about to do my little acceleration test. The eight-speed gearbox actually never gets in your way, really. It's quite a good unit, quite a good tuning on it as well. And you can pull this back into B to get more kind of regeneration. And you can scroll through here as well to make the engine recharge the battery if you want it to. Obviously, that uses petrol in exchange for electrons. Anyway, I am doing 30 miles an hour. I'm about to go into a national speed limit, which is 60 miles an hour here in the UK. Let's see how quick it is. Right, back down to 30 and boot it. 60. It is really quick, especially in that power mode. And what I find quite surprising, considering this is on, you know, manually adjustable dampers, is how the car's character changes between driving modes. In power mode, it just... Bleh, it turns into corners a lot more quickly and feels a bit more balanced in the corners and a bit more eager. So I guess it's tuning the torque vectoring on the two rear motors. It's very clever. And this thing can haul round corners at speeds that defy logic, physics, and frankly, my bravery is really, really impressive. And in that way, it's kind of similar, I guess, to a Bentley. Big, heavy car doing things it shouldn't be able to do here through the use of electric motors. But yeah, it's got loads of punch. It's just that bit where you're, you know, setting off from zero, where it's not biblically quick. Once you're up and going, though, poof, it is fast. It's not, like, supercar fast, but it's noticeable. I mean, obviously, you do feel that electric shove, and it's instant from the back end. So, yeah, it's a really pleasant driving experience. It just don't come to it expecting, like, supercar levels of precision or angriness it's just it's, it's just a slightly different take on driving and i really like it oh i didn't talk about the engine noise it's a bit gruff it's not unpleasant but i wish it had like a six cylinder or something like that just for a bit of being a bit more sophisticated than a four cylinder it's all right and you don't really hear the supercharger or the turbocharger but it's got a bit of a fizz to it you just just wish it sounded a bit different anyway let's put us back in oh i don't know hybrid for everyday use everything gets quiet everything's a bit more gentle and it's time to go back to you tim for an outro now it started raining brilliant so in conclusion, what do I make of the Polestar 1? Well, there's no doubting it's a bit of a low volume, high price curiosity because it's not uber comfortable like GT car should be. Don't get me wrong, it's pretty good, but it could be plusher and pillowier, it could be faster, but it's just very clever and kind of a statement of intent of what Polestar is capable of. Obviously it's going full electric now, Polestar as a brand, so we won't see any more hybrids from them, but, as a £140,000 thing, it does feel incredibly special. And if you want a beautiful car like this that really makes a statement and is like nothing else, then you can't go wrong with it. It doesn't really have any direct competitors. It's just its own thing. And if you come to expecting like supercar performance or anything like that or enjoyment, you're not going to really get it. But it makes you feel special. It's lovely inside. It's very relaxing. And it's got that chilled out Scandi vibe. And you could just park this in your living room and gore pat it. Anyway, thank you for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, hit my bell, and I'll see you next time with fewer cows doing things. And vans. <laughs>